So good to see you all here this morning. I'm going to go through some announcements quickly. And while I'm doing that, register your attendance. This is really great. You guys have been doing an awesome job at making note, noting your name on the cards and, and uh, so that we can kind of keep an ongoing record. So we really appreciate that. You'll bring it up here in a minute when we uh, sing our offering song. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, you can also scan, use the little, little, little code there. You can do it that way. That's kind of fun if you like playing with your phones. Um, let's see, a couple of things on the back. We have, uh, I just wanted to make, mention this class that uh, first talks that happens at 9.30. If you're looking for something to do at 9.30, this is a great discussion group. It's centered around TED Talks, and uh, Andrea and Oz Flores do an amazing job with, with bringing fascinating topics and uh, Charm oversees and works with them. And it's, it's a really engaging uh, group. Uh, uh, so I hope you'll come and join us sometime. We had, I think, um, almost 20 people in there today, and it was really a good discussion. Um, so we don't have the themes down there. You can always find that out ahead of time online if you go to the website, the church website. It's always listed. But it happens in 2.30, which is a great casual room to meet in as well. Um, the new book, Study Happy Accidents. Hope you can join us for that. Just to get the information there, it'll be led by one of our local comedians, Wynn LaRue. And uh, that's going to be a lot of fun as we look at improvisation in terms of relationships, in terms of business, in terms of, of faith. It's just going to be a lot of fun. Not so much technique on how to. We might play around with some games, but more in terms of just being present to the way in which uncertainty opens us up to happy accidents. And the grace of God in the midst of all of that. So um, say, oh, here, we saved the date. I've got Sharm's going to come up here and tell us something. And I think maybe we got, do we have a screen slide up there? All right. Okay, so this is a fun announcement. As fun as everything Tom has said, also we're having a retreat. Yay. Doesn't that sound good? Just one night, one day, March the 2nd, Friday afternoon, we're going to arrive at uh, Stillwater Lodge, which is over in Glen Rose, just a short drive from here. And we'll stay that night and the next day, check out at 3, back home in plenty of time to be where on Sunday morning? Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, just a 24-hour get-off-the-grid kind of thing. There's details about lodging that you can see right there. Um, the website is down today, the church website, but maybe it'll be back up tomorrow. But write that down, please, if you are interested. So you can go there and sign up. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're hoping to do a little stargazing on Friday night. We're going to tell stories and lies and fables and laugh a lot and eat together. So it'll be a fun time. I hope to see you there. Also, this announcement is not quite as fun, but I could use one more engineer, a chair engineer, to help us on Sunday mornings for days like today. So would you see me after church if that's something you're interested in? I think we're going to really nail down what this place is really supposed to look like so when we get here we're not guessing. <laughs> not, this is nothing about all the people who help me because I'm telling them one thing and somebody else is telling them another. So see me if you're interested. Um, I'm not Brad, I'm Jaina. Okay, so the welcome candle has been lit, and if you would join me in saying the welcome together. Come, come, whoever you are, wonder, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter, ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vows a thousand times, come yet again. I need a sign to let me know you're here. All of these lines are being crossed over the atmosphere. I need to know that things are gonna look good. I feel it's drowning in a sea spilled from a cup. Well, there's no place safe and no safe place to put my head. When you feel the world is shaking from the words that I say, I call in all angels. I call in all you Give up. I won't 
give up, you don't give up. I won't give up, you don't give up. I won't give up, you don't give up. I need a sign to let me know you're here. Cause my TV set just keeps it all from being clear. For the way things have to be I need a hand to help me build up Some kind of hope inside of me Cause I, I, I Call it all angels And I I'm calling all you So they don't disappear When private eyes solve marriage lies Cause we don't stop for years And football teams are kissing queens And losing sight of having dreams In a world of what we want It's only what we want until it's ours together. Holy One, we are here calling angels. We're calling out the angels in ourselves and in each other because life is crazy and life is hard and we really need each other and the sense of you that we see in each other. And so we give thanks for this time together. Even though life is hard for us, Holy One, and crazy and all of that, it's also good, also full of hope and promise. And so again, we give thanks that we have each other to um, urge each other to remember those things. And so today, as we spend this bit of time, help us to keep our eyes and ears open to hope, our eyes and ears open to creativity for embracing and, and working through the difficult things we may find ourselves in. In all of it, this, we have trust and hope. And we say this in the name of the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen. We want to invite everybody to please stand and sing your little hearts out with us now, would you please? And if you have an offering, now is a super great time to bring it to the table. Here we go, just like this. God of movement, work inside us. Send your rain and nurture us all. Tend our roots and hearts excite us. Help us hear your ancient call. In our pain and in our laughter, present ever throughout all our days. Here before and now and after, may our living things give you praise. 
Awesome. Let's go for verse two. Y'all ready? As a tiny seed is planted, roots emerge and growth begins. So we ask our hearts enchanted, bring your kingdom forth from within. Yeah. Love unquenchable, hope unstoppable, reign of justice, breathe no end. Use our lives and make it possible that your garden be made. Last verse, let's make it good. Send us forth to sow and scatter seeds that grow your kingdom on earth. Make it clear the ways that matter, those which bring new life and new birth. Through your people, bring your healing in our lives and the fruits that we grow. Evermore your kingdom revealing, now's the time to plant and sow. Let's bring it home. Evermore your kingdom revealing, now's the time to plant and sow. Okay, so I'm going to have a little fun real quick here with our greeting and passing of the peace. So this morning we're talking about trust as one of those intentional practices that we participate in, in this idea of living on purpose. So here's what I want you to do. Some of you that read my blog already know what I'm going to ask you to do. I know you had a binky at one time, or a blankie, or a baba, or a little bit, or a whoopee. Or as my granddaughter has, stain. <laughs> That's one of my, he's also called fluffy be, or puffy because it has a cloud stain on it, but uh, we just call it stain. Anyway, so what I want you to do is I want you to turn to somebody and as you say hi and welcome them, I want you to say, mine was called. And if you can't think of it, maybe you can think of a grandchild or, an, or niece or nephew or something like that. And if you can't think of it, just say, I've forgotten what I used to trust in, <laughs> but I'm hoping to rediscover it today. Take a moment and share with one another.
think it's been a while since we've done this song together, but I'm going to invite y'all to join, the, join us in singing it again. It's a goodie. Here it comes. If I were to pray, if I were to pray, Breaking of the morning or the dying of the day, what would I say? What would I say? What would my heart speak if I were to pray? If I were to sing. If I were to sing, if my soul could give some honest offering, what would I bring? What would I bring? What are the simple truths my soul would want to sing? If I do, will not the earth in me? Will not the sacred life in all creation turn to land and ear? Will not my song throughout the cosmos ring and swim in that crystal river that flows? sing some more. If I were to pray, if I were to pray, in the breaking of the morning, or the dying of the day, what would I say? What would I say? What would my heart speak? If I were to pray There are two words for time in the Greek language. One is chronos, which is the uh, like time on a clock, the uh, quantitative time. The other is kairos. And kairos is kind of a, a strange word. It means something a little different. It's more like a qualitative time. The root word for kairos originally meant, um, it was a verb that when you are weaving and the, you have the strings on the, Thank you. Uh, the sp strings on the loom. And when you bring the shuttle up between the strings, uh, that's when you're practicing kairos, so the spaces between the strings. Uh, in ancient Greece, kairos sort of meant something like opportune time or the appropriate time. Uh, and as the word evolved and we come into you know, the New Testament, uh, it meant something a little more like um, the time that God is acting, like when Jesus says in uh, Matthew 25, uh, God gives us our food in due time, in due season. And there's that word season as translating kairos. You move a little more forward in time uh, to the Christian era. The word kairos has come to mean uh, something a little more esoteric. In the Greek church, they would use the word kairos in a sentence uh, to announce that uh, it, it, we're starting the part of the service where eternity 
uh, where, where eternity intersects with what we're doing, um, where we stop the flowing of chronological time and God comes between the spaces and um, we realize our communion uh, together. Sometimes modern translators will translate the word kairos by making up new words like avertonity or now ever or something like that. But, it, but it's a word that goes beyond just rational time. It can't be explained, but we know it is. So if you would uh, meditate with me as I read the following. Uh, some people clo- like to close their eyes so they can uh, not be distracted during this time. Um, others will find it useful to listen to their breath um, so they're not distracted by their thoughts. Okay. Look, and it can't be seen. Listen, and it can't be heard. Reach, and it can't be grasped. Above, it isn't bright. Below, it isn't dark. Seamless, unnameable, it returns to the realm of nothing. Form that includes all forms. Image without an image. Subtle, beyond all conception. Approach it, and there is no beginning. Follow it, and there is no end. You can't know it, but you can be it at ease in your own life. Just realize where you come from. This is the essence of wisdom. Use your own light and return to the source of light. This is called practicing eternity. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Every one that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Amen. This morning's reading comes from Matthew 16, 1 through 4, and Acts 17, 27 through 28. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came up. And testing Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. But he replied to them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the sign of the times? An evil evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it, except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. God did this so they would seek God and perhaps reach out and find God. Though God is not far away from any one of us, for in God we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are God's offspring. woman now I just have women I used to have some good luck now I just carry these charms I used to have a fine sense of humor but I traded it for complications now instead of reaching for the distance I just fold these tired arms mm. I used to dream in one fine color sweet hazy sublime sheet of red Now it's just the black and the white or else some strange psychedelic nightmare. A whole mess of colors swirling around instead. And it seems one love is far greater than many. One feeling never could be ignored. Two times of fun could be far too many. Too much of a good thing ain't no good Mm. I used to give away a flower a day Now I've got me a field of roses 
then stare back at me from the window and beg me for somewhere to go. I used to leave the light on after the sunset. Now I just sit in the darkness. Count the hours as they roll by and I sip my bourbon slow. And I know that one love is far greater than many. One feeling never can be ignored. Two times the fun can be far too many. And too much of a good thing ain't no good. Off. There we go. I love a little blues right before I stand up. <laughs> Brad, Brad's calling me up. He's right before this this weekend. Is like Tommy. You remember those first words? I used to have one woman. Now I just have many. I'm slow sipping my bourbon. Can we sing that? And I said, Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of real life. There's this, there's this struggle with trust, I think, sometimes, not knowing what to trust. We, we surround ourselves with so many options. We surround ourselves with so many pathways. And then we wonder, how did we get in this tangled web we've woven? I'm, I'm quoting somebody there. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and then we realize one good thing can really be a whole lot better than a lot. But then what is that one thing? that we need to lean in on. So we're talking about trust, and we're part of this series that I've been talking about, living on purpose and being intentional. But being intentional has more to do with opening up than it has to do with laser focus. And that's the challenge sometimes. But that's also where we often get mixed up. We're often looking for the sign. We often run to what we think it is, and then it's yanked out from under us, or something happens totally unexpected. So to start off this morning, as we think about trusting the ground, I want to tell you two stories, two stories about the same thing. First story is this. There was this fellow who had gone hiking along a cliff, and as he was hiking along, he got, his footing slipped, and as he slipped, he started sliding down the side of the cliff and reached out and grabbed hold of a vine. And he was clinging to this vine. He had probably 500 feet below him still to fall. And what he noticed at the bottom was he noticed there was this tiger or mountain lion or something like that just looking up like, here comes lunch. <laughs> and he was clinging to this vine and thought he would pull himself up when he looked up and he noticed two mice had started nibbling on that vine. And he started crying out, help, somebody help me. And then he heard a voice from above, and it said, Jack, it's God. Just trust me. Let go. Who is that? 
It's God, Jack, just trust me, let go. And then there was a long period of silence before, before he looked up and said, is anybody else up there? <laughs> then the second story, which comes from a different tradition, but the same exact story with a different perspective. A man was climbing along the edge of a cliff and he lost his footing and started sliding down the cliff. And as he reached out, he grabbed a vine. And he noticed that this vine was clinging just between some rock, but just enough to hold on to. And down below him, he saw this mountain lion looking up at him, starving, drooling at its mouth. And up above, he saw these two mice coming down and nibbling at the vine. And then he noticed there were two strawberries on the vine. And they were delicious. A lot of people, I think, kind of get mixed up. They get trust the wrong way in a way that ultimately, I think, is less helpful for our relationships at work and with one another and for our faith. We cling to ideas or beliefs or relationships from the position of expectation. We trust in a sense that there's going to be something concrete that will happen, that, that, that our belief is going to come about, that what we believe in will in fact take place, that the government will act the way it's supposed to act or that we want it to act, or that our pe the people in our relationship will, do, will be the way we expect them to be, or our kids will act the way we expect them to act, or I won't make mistakes, I'll, do, I'll make the right kinds of decisions, and that life itself won't hit us upside the head, pull the carpet out from under us, or deal a tragic kind of experience with us. We tend to think of trust as this sort of blind faith that things will work out. But if we, if we unpack what we mean by things will work out, we've already got the work out planned. We've already got the whole direction set. It's one way of seeing trust that is deeply, deeply, decidedly attached to an outcome that better be or else. And if I don't get that outcome, then what happens? I stop trusting. I break off my relationship with that person, that child, that government, that car company that said it'd fix my car, the bank, or life itself. And it all starts to fall apart around us. Admittedly, this makes perfect sense, I think, because our brains are designed that way, right? Our reptilian brains, the, the basal part of our brain stem, it's designed around fight or flight. It's designed around safety. And happiness for us sometimes starts at this place where we feel like we can, we can trust the ground we stand on, right? We don't like things to happen to us that shake us up. It's not normal. We want things to stay normal for us. And then we find ourselves, when our lives get compromised, when that normalcy gets turned over on in, we find ourselves looking out and perhaps saying in our own words, is there anybody else out there? This is something what I think the text means. When we read in the text, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees, as, as Brad had read this, this idea of you're, you, you're looking for signs, you're looking how to predict things. You know, you're trying to be astronomical and trying to figure out what, when, and what will happen, when it will happen. And he says, this generation doesn't understand. It can't even see what's going on in front of its face. He says, the only sign you'll get is the sign of Jonah. What a weird thing to say. What does that mean? Now, I'm not a biblical scholar, and I'll be the first to admit that, but I do know a little bit about about the story of Jonah. I mean, you all know the story of Jonah, the, 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 the favored prophet of God in the 8th or ninth century. I can't remember exactly when, but he's, he's called upon by God to go and preach to the very enemy the Hebrew people hate, the very nemesis of what they despise in life, the very representation of that, their own sort of shadow side, if you will. And he says, God says to, to Jonah, go and, go and preach peace and love and my forgiveness to these people, salvation, if they just simply accept it, if they turn their ways, they'll be a part of this, this community, this kingdom, this reality that you so trust in. And Jonah says, no, they won't. I'm not going over there. They're Muslim. They're gay. They're black. They're women. I'm not going to go talk to them. And what does God do? 
he ends up having to do that anyway. It makes no sense to Jonah. Why would I preach to the one thing I just, oh, I failed to say, they're Republicans. <laughs> they're Democrats. I, I forgot to say that part too. God calls Jonah to do the one thing that's t totally antithetical to him. What is the sign of Jonah? The sign of Jonah is that nothing is certain. When it comes to God, when it comes to the ground of our being, it's not necessarily the way you want it to be. The sign of Jonah is this idea of uncertainty. So I'm going to let that sink in for just a second. And I want to talk a little bit about healthy trust and mistrust because it has more often to do with what makes us uncomfortable than with what we really believe in or what we really want out of life. If we, were allow, if we could allow ourselves to sort of sit with the discomfort, sit with the uncertainty, what we really want starts to surface. Uh, that, that wonderful uh, 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 Middle Eastern poet Rumi, you'll remember this, we've said this one in here before, it feels counterintuitive this kind of openness to uncertainty, but it's one of my favorite poets, uh, poems from the 13th century mystic poet. This being human is a guest house. Every morning is a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome them. Entertain them all. Even if they are a crowd of sorrows, who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. How do we trust in the ground when the ground seems shaky? How do we trust in reality when reality seems so divisive, so unpredictable, so counterintuitive, so unpleasant for many of us in so many different ways? How much of our divisiveness in our church, if you just think about this, over human sexuality is based more on what we don't want and what we're afraid of than on what we really deeply, honestly long for? How much of the polarization that we experience in our country over politics is really based on our fear of what might happen and what we hate than what we would truly deeply long for and truly love if we could get past that hate and fear? How much of the tensions in our relationships at home and at work are really based more on our fear of what we might lose than on our inability to recognize what we in fact have? People tend to define themselves by what they don't want to be like, by what they don't want life to be like, than by their ultimately what they do want, what they disagree with rather than what they would finally, if they could get past that, recognize they do agree with. And that's because we simply default. That's who we are. We default to wherever our neurological comfort zones are and are reinforced by the beliefs that keep those neurological things safe that keep that anxiety safe, that keep that uncertainty at bay. Science tells us our brains are just wired this way, so we're wired to resist, to fight or flight, to fear, to avoid, to mistrust. It's the way we're wired. Trusting takes a long time to establish because of that reason, and even longer to reestablish. We reorient ourselves around what we distrust, and we miss the strawberries right in front of us. So, I was visiting a growler station over in Dallas a couple of weeks ago. And this guy, he's the, I don't know what you call him, the growler tender, the bartender, the, the barista, I'm not sure. But, but So, I've decided to do this. I've decided to sort of disempower my shyness, to sort of give it less rule over my life. Because if you really know me, you know I really am an introvert. And, that's, and so, two things, first of all. I'm an introvert and I have monovision. I, I have one contact in my left eye. So I, I suffer from, from this thing that, that's called, I think, proso, prosopagnosia. <laughs> prosopagnosia. Some of you know what this is. I suffer from facial uh, inability to, to recognize faces sometimes, a little bit. I think it may be the contact. 
Or I think it may be the introversion. And then sometimes Linda's just sitting by me and she says, that's not who you think it is. <laughs> so that happens too. And I say this only because I run into people all the time at the store or at the somewhere along the line and, and people, I'm just terrified that you think I don't like you or I'm just rude. I'd prefer that you think maybe I'm just eccentric or something like that, but that you would come up to me and say hello. And I don't know if you're a librarian from a former school I had toured and performed at or if you're the kid's mother or at that school or if you're in fact my cousin. <laughs> So it helps if you just kind of come up and say something. So I'm trying to break this sort of category of shyness and, and introversion, and I've decided I will engage with people, clerks, cashiers, uh, baristas. I'm just going to open up and engage a little bit because that's what I believe, that's what I believe our faith and our spirituality is about, is opening up that we meet God in that place of meeting, honest, vulnerable, transparent sort of meeting, curiosity. That's where I think we find some of the richness of God's presence. And it is a little uncertainty. But anyway, I, I'm digressing. So I, I'm at this growler station, and I talk to this guy. And after a while, he asks me the, all, you know, the question that's going to happen. It's going to come up, right? And he asks me, he says, so, so hey, Tom, because I introduced myself. And he said, hey, Tom, so, so what do you do? What's your work? And admittedly, I was going to say something obscure like, I write and speak at a Fort Worth institution for perceptively and deeply engaged thinkers, existential wanderers, and compassionate caregivers. <laughs> but instead, I just threw out the obvious for public consumption, and I said, I'm a pastor. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he said, wow, dude, and you drink beer. <laughs> then he held up my 64-ounce growler and said, a lot of beer. And I said, listen, the monks, okay, they're the ones that perfected brewery back in the 8th, 9th century, all right? And, he, and so he kind of laughed, and next thing you know, he's on this tirade, this sort of confessional tirade. You know, I don't believe in God. And, and he starts to dismiss the church for all of its obsoleteness or all of its inconsistencies and all of its irrelevancies, and that God can't possibly be this super being. Science has told us we're so far beyond that kind of mythology. And he starts to just go from one thing to the next until he finally says, listen, I mean, who's to say that I'm not right with the world and all the universe if I'm not doing my thing and also working to better the world and helping people who are hurting when I see them and hanging out with Muslims and gay people and working with Habitat for Humanity and spending some time fishing on Sunday. Oh, and if I contribute to public radio. <laughs> Who's to say I'm not doing the right thing? And I looked at him and I laughed and I said, well, not me. Sounds like you're a real Christian. And then he looked at me and said, I am not a Christian. And I said, well, you better stop acting like Jesus. And the funniest thing happened, he looked at me and he kind of smiled because a light had gone on in his head. He had approached everything from what he didn't agree with, that there wasn't room for him to suddenly discover what he might agree with and that he might be surprised. So how much of our trust or our mistrust is really based on what we don't want to see or don't believe in or disagree with or are afraid of happening instead of what we really long to do? And so here's my point. Trust has less to do with certainty than being fully committed. It has more to do with being fully committed to the mystery and curiosity of what is sacred in our lives, where God is the very ground of our being. And at some point, we have to let go of how things are supposed to be. At some point, we have to open up to the possibility that this mystery we live in that we call God which is really God beyond God for us, because even then we run the risk of nailing it down exactly who and what God is. And before you know it, we've nailed it down so much that once again we're back to that place that our reptile brain wants to go when it says, this is what I believe, now what do you believe? It's so easy to fall back there. We have to live with this sort of gospel of doubt that opens us up to trust the uncertainty. And the way we get there, I think, is we invest. We stop looking for trust. We stop waiting for trust to happen. When things shake us up, we look for where we can invest trust. When things don't go the way we expect them to go, and sometimes they can be overwhelming things, sometimes we have to simply sit with it a while, 
Sometimes we have to look out at the roses like the song was singing. It's calling us, but we just need to sit a while. But sometimes sitting begins to open up what is in fact at the, at the ground of our being. We have to invest. We have to be willing to take those risks. The other day I was watching, I was at Starbucks, and I was looking out the window, and I saw a flock of starlings. I guess they were starlings. They, they were those massive amounts of birds, thousands of them that they fly around, and they create these amazing shapes as they're flying. And I was just watching them as they moved this way and they'd moved that way. And I remember hearing online uh, the, on, and on being an interview with the guy who was the founder of Wired magazine. And he was talking about the net, the, inter the, the social network, and how it's a being all in itself. We think of it as technology, but in reality, we are part of that technology, and it is part of us. And he says, we're kind of like starlings. It kind of moves this direction and that direction. And sometimes it can be overwhelming. And that's when perhaps we need to make a more personal investment in seeing what change we can be about, what we can bring about. There's this idea that perhaps what we need to do is to invest in creating trust. So I, I close with this, with, this, with this idea. I have two neighbors, and, and these neighbors, one lives a couple of blocks down and one lives on my block. In fact, it's my, well, I won't go any further than that. I don't want to be too specific. But I have these two neighbors, and they both decided to plant trees in their yard. These, these uh, fruit trees, one is a, is, a, uh, is a pear tree, and the other one is a persimmon kind of tree. I'm not sure exactly. It's a different kind of fruit I don't recognize, but it's in the backyard, and it has these beautiful leaves during the fall. When they, when they start to shed the leaves, they turn sort of a deep, deep red, and it's very pretty. And then, of course, the pear tree turns this orange and yellow, which is really beautiful. But now this one neighbor, she planted the tree in her backyard, and it's planted just inside the fence line, far enough away from the fence that all of the fruit is right there hanging in the backyard. And, she, and she's got so excited about when she could finally you know, you know, get that fruit from the tree. The other neighbor lives down the street. He's got two pear trees planted in the front yard, and they're on the sidewalk. And I asked him why he did that. And he said, because it gives him great joy to see people walk by and look at the fruit. And if he's there and they don't do it on their own, he simply steps out and says, take one. But what he hopes is that people will just grab the fruit, that he can share what he plants with everyone around him. There's a way of trusting which looks not to what I can have sureness about, that I can have certainty about, that I can have guarantee that my life will go the way it should go. The sign of Jonah is that that's just not the way life is. Life is about reconciliation, but how you get there can be messy. Normal life is not a predicted everything goes the way it, you all are parents, you know this, uh, and you kids in school. I mean, we all know life doesn't go the way we think it should go or that we hope it would go. When we find ourselves in those places of uncertainty, the invitation is to respond. What's the next thing that comes to mind when you see someone hungry? Don't think about it. Don't stop and check it out. Do what naturally comes to the altruistic side of you. Do what naturally comes from the very ground of our being. If someone's hungry, make sure you've got some food in your car. If someone's thirsty, make sure you're carrying some extra water around. If someone's arguing, make sure you stop to listen. Just being present. Deep down, the ground of our being knows what it means to connect with the greater ground of our being, with God. Amen. times like these you're driven down to your knees looking around and grieving what peace there was you promised yourself you would work for a world of good but look at you now 
wondering what good it does. No lost hope, no violent points of you can erase all of so strong as light but here is the choice to let it burn out or bright in a world where the fear and force have buried the silent source can you deny the need for a light like yours Someone has left his wrath on everything in his path, taking the wealth and leaving his trash behind. Will you be peace or pride? Can you at last decide? There's no one to fight. We are the same inside. So go home and get some some rest. There's many more miles and tests. It's all about love. What if it comes to be all that we have left? No dark. So I invite you, thank you, Lisa. It's so good to have Lisa back with us this morning and singing. I mean, the whole band, y'all are always amazing. Y'all are just always amazing. It's, it's such a beautiful thing. And, and you know what I love about this community? We all know each other's, many of our stories we know so well. And um, I love the vulnerability that we bring to this space, to this openness. Even if we're not that intentional about it, there's just something about your willingness to sit in a circle with one another. That in itself is probably more profound than we sometimes remember or realize. So it's so good to see you all here to be a part of our worship this morning. I'm going to invite everyone to stand as we have our blessing. Stick around and visit afterwards. I shared this blessing last week. It's been kind of a blessing as part of this series, this series sort of being broken open. This is a, a, a blessing that was written uh, by the, a Northern Ireland man that I know, uh, Patrick McCullough. And um, it's called Go in Pieces. It's this idea of what happens when we recognize the uncertainty, but yet we lean into the ground of being. How do we do that? How are we present in those moments to where God and mystery invite us to be? So, go in pieces. The task is ended. 
go in pieces. Our con concluding faith is being rear-ended, certainties being amended, and something is getting mended that we didn't know was torn. We're unraveling and are traveling to a place of new formed patterns with delusion as a fusion of loss and hope and pain and beauty. So the task is now ended. Go in pieces to see and feel and love in the world. Amen. Happy birthday to Lisa and Claire. Happy birthday to both Lisa and Claire. Happy birthday, we see you standing there. Happy birthday to y'all.